Okay, I think everyone is back, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Tennyson. I'm a Texarkana native, sixth generation Texan. I graduated Arkansas High School in 1986, and I currently live in San Antonio, but it's good to be back in Texarkana because I still consider this to be my hometown, even though San Antonio is my home base. Um, as some of you might have known, we first presented publicly on the Phantom Killer, Jeremy and I both, in 2014 in November. And we're back today to talk much more specifically about much more specific details. Um, this is the second half of today's talk. Uh, the title of my half is YHB Duty Tennyson is a more compelling suspect as Phantom Killer than Yule Swinney. Um, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that you should believe that HB Tennyson was the Phantom Killer. I'm not even saying that, that he is the most likely to be the Phantom Killer. I rather I'm making a specific comparative statement. As compared to Yule Swinney, based on the evidence that I'm aware of, which I will present today, and which I can elaborate on it at other times as well, I believe he's a more compelling uh, suspect than Yule Swinney. There might very well be a third suspect that we don't even know about, uh, who is unnamed at this point, who might even have more compelling evidence for them. But if you're just doing a comparison between Yule Swinney and H.B. Tennyson, um, if I were, as I sometimes say, if God came down and said, John, you have to make a forced dichotomous choice of who you think the Phantom Killer was, and if you get the right answer, uh, you get to go to heaven. But if not, you're out of luck. I would put my money on H.P. Tennyson. But that doesn't mean that I believe that it was H.P. Tennyson. So I hope that qualifies uh, that, that in a nuanced way that matter. OK, so H.P. Tennyson was in the graduating class of Arkansas High School in 1948. So this is actually the class of 48, but it's during their freshman year. So unlike a previous photo that I showed you, this is actually uh, described to me as probably having been taken in the month of May of 1945. So this is, if that's true, this is less than a year before the Phantom Killer started, and therefore Duty or H.B. Tennyson in this picture uh, is going to be closer in age or closer to the time that the Phantom Killings occurred than in the senior photo that I've previously shown you. Um, if you want to know where H.B. Tennyson is, he's up here at the very top. I'm going to zoom in, and there he is. Okay, so this is H.P. Tennyson, approximately May 1945, less than one year before the Phantom Killing started because uh, the first killing started as, in March of 1946. He's not very happy. He doesn't look happy. Yeah, I, I mean, this is kind of a, I don't know what to make of that. It's kind of a sour expression. Um, it is the case that he was having uh, academic difficulty. He, it's probably the case that he was not mentally retarded, but it, it seems to be the case he didn't care much about school. He was performing very poorly in his sophomore year of school when the fan killings were occurring. Um, he barely passed uh, high school based on his grades, I'll put it that way. And his sophomore year was his worst year of all. Um, plus his father had left the family, got divorced from his mother, and he had had a significant downturn turn in his socioeconomic status. And he and his siblings were, were very unhappy about that. Okay, so this is what he wrote. This was a note discovered at, at a, in the bottom of a lockbox in the room in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where he took his life. Um, this is an excerpt from that note, but this is the most important part of the note, the so-called confession note, discovered on Friday, November 5th, 1948. Quote, why did I take my own life? Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night and killed Mr. Starks and tried to get Mrs. Starks. Now, some confusion comes from you know, the question of what exactly was H.B. confessing to or trying to imply he had done. Um, given that the Starks attack was not a double murder, it appears that H.B. was trying to implicate himself as being responsible for both the Martin Booker and Griffin Moore murders, as these were the only two double murders. That is, even though H.B. does not confess using the grammatical form of, quote, I killed Griffin and Moore, he nonetheless strongly implies that he had done so. <coughs> But since HB's note only contained an explicit confession of having murdered three people, many newspapers jumped to the conclusion that HB's note uh, indicated responsibility for only three of the five murders. However, not all newspapers did. Some newspapers actually did interpret that note in a, what I think is a plausible and reasonable way, in such that their headline was, Student Suicide Checked as Phantom Killer of Five. So it's certainly a reasonable interpretation when you look at what he wrote that he could have been trying to convey the idea that he had actually had killed five people. He, he doesn't make any commentary, seemingly, on the first attack on Mary Jean Larry and Jimmy Hollis, who, of course, both survived. So he's not, he doesn't appear to be implying or explicitly making comment about them. Okay, uh, you've seen this before. This I've shown you at the, in, back in 2014. This is the senior photo. 
HB is at the very top in the middle, right there. I'm going to zoom in. He's right there. I have interviewed many people, I, I would say several people, probably about 15 or at least people from this class. Um, and I can, I'm going to show you some, pe some interviews today. Um, the, pe the interviews I'm going to show you today are actually not from his classmate. I, one of them is a classmate, actually. The other three are not. But anyway, this is the senior photo. One thing that's clear uh, is that when H.B. committed suicide in November of 1948, when he went to college, he was said to have been six foot three inches tall at that time. I can promise you from looking at several photos, some of which I don't have in the slideshow today, that this, as well as when he was 13, even a couple years earlier, this is not seemingly a six foot three person. And uh, he might, I don't know how tall he was there. I'm not sure he was even six foot three there, but it appears to be the case that he experienced an abnormally uh, significant growth spurt between his sophomore year and his, uh, and this fall, of, or I should say first semester of his time in college when he was said to be six foot three. Um, I do not believe he was six foot three during the Phantom Killings. Okay. So one thing that's worth mentioning is prior to the publicity of Yul Swinney as the prime suspect that started in the 1970s, H.B. Tennyson had been the most highly publicized suspect uh, in the case of the Texarkana area phantom killings. This was primarily because of his confession and the suicide that occurred in 1948. Although he had, been, uh, he had never been ruled out as a suspect, uh, even by the 1970s, many people had either forgotten that he was ever a suspect or mistakenly believed that he had been ruled out as a suspect. And for me, that's one of the most newsworthy things, even, perhaps even more so uh, than the question of who was the Phantom Killer. The fact that people either come to believe that someone was despite adequate or reliable evidence, or the fact that they believe someone was ruled out despite not really having good evidence uh, to suggest or to, to indicate that they were. Um, here's, a, here's a letter to J.R. Hoover. Um, it's an FBI document. And it, this is after the suicide of H.B. in 48. It says, the series of murders are of great public interest, having received national publicity, as evidenced by a recent confession by a college student of having committed the murders. Local authorities have as yet, uh, not as yet solved the case. That's the content in this letter. Um, they were, the FBI was recruited to do several thousand more <laughs> fingerprint tests, uh, fingerprints in, on the, in the both Arkansas and Texas side of Texarkana um, after H.B.'s suicide. So it's almost like this precipitated additional investigation. They certainly were not acting as though that they believed that they had gotten the Phantom Killer or, or that they had put him away. Because I think it, as Jeremy might have mentioned, I think it was like 12,000 more sets of prints, if I'm not mistaken, but it was a lot more prints even after HB's suicide. Okay, this is Lone Wolf Gazoss's boss. This is Homer Garrison, Jr. He's the, he was the head of the Texas Department of Public Safety and therefore overall the Texas Rangers. One thing he's quoted in more than one source and saying after the investigation of H.B. Tennyson had culminated, he still said that H.B. has not been completely eliminated as a suspect. And if you think about it, they're really, if you look at the things that they did, and the things they could have done, even if they wanted to eliminate him, they, there really wasn't much they could have done to eliminate him as a suspect. The only way really that he could have been eliminated as a suspect would be to find some other suspect who, for, for which the evidence was so compelling that it had to be that guy. Because H.B., he was dead, they couldn't interview him, and there wasn't really, in terms of evidence, much that could be tested, at least given their technology and their ideas at the time, that would have ruled him out. But nonetheless, that idea of him being ruled out was promoted in the newspapers in a way which, in my opinion, was very misleading. And I'm going to show examples of that. Um, also, it was the case in the 19, four, not, I'm sorry, 2014 uh, documentary of, called Killer Legends that local researcher Casey, uh, Ro Casey Roberts, um, said that one person that I haven't been satisfied he was cleared was a young man that committed suicide. He's referring to H.B. So that's, that's a, another example. Not that he believes it was H.B., he just did not think that he was ruled out. I want to be very clear about that. So there are various false, misleading, or presumptuous statements printed in published media over the years. And as much as I love the Texarkana Gazette, and I do love the Texarkana Gazette, they have been responsible for some of these false and misleading things. Um, on November 8th, two days uh, after the body was found, they they wrote, um, note, I'm sorry, three days after, it was Monday, um, because the body was found on the 5th, which was a Friday. They wrote the, the quote, note canceling murder admission found. Also in 1971, James Presley falsely wrote, in November 1948, a University of Arkansas freshman from Texarkana committed suicide and left a confession that he was the fan of murder, but subsequent checking proved definitely that he could not have been or that he couldn't have been. That's not true. There, no, there was no subsequent checking that proved he could not have been the Phantom Killer. So that's a false statement. Also in 2013, November 4th, um, 
there was an article that kind of reviewed past headlines and it said that HB had left behind a message denying he was the phantom killer. He never left behind a message denying he was the phantom killer. What he did is there was a message that he left in which he said, don't disregard other notes, uh, apparently for the reasons I took my life, not because they were false or not because I didn't actually kill someone. He, ne he never said that. So there was no explicit denial of having killed someone or having been a, a phantom killer, although he didn't use the term phantom killer. Um, also in James Presley's 2014 book, he wrote that HB's confession didn't fit the facts to begin with. Um, that's simply not true. I, mean, I asked Jim about that on the phone one day. I said, in what way did his confession not fit the facts? And he could not give me a single example of how that was true. So that's, that's not really a true statement either. Um, this is Sheriff Bruce Kreider. Sheriff Kreider, he was, between th he was almost 34 years old at the time that HB's body was found in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, he must have had a very disconcerting experience because he had an opinion about the order in which the notes were found that was in contrast to the, what was being, uh, to, to the spin that was being given by the Texarkana Gazette. And this is that whole uh, Arkansas paper that I referred to a moment ago at, during the break. Uh, this is what, you know, Bruce, Sheriff Bruce Kreider, this is when he was older, of course, he, would have, he was the head of the investigation. He was the sheriff in Washington County in where Fayetteville, Arkansas is. Um, he would have been as familiar with those notes as any uh, law enforcement official. And uh, his opinions on the matter were not represented in the Texarkana Gazette. And here, here's some very important information. Um, this is, this is uh, regarding Sheriff Kreider. Quote, since that time, a detailed investigation has been made of all of his statements. That's HB's suicide notes and other notes. And a study of notes left by him, the statement said. Washington County Sheriff Bruce Kreider, who originally investigated the suicide, said, however, he is still not satisfied as to the reasons for some of Tennyson's statements in the notes. Quote, he seemed to imply in one note that he had told someone before that he was at the park that night when Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin were killed. And if you, if you remember that note, it's, it, it does have a sentence structure. If I'm going to go back a little bit. I could have actually done that with a, an additional slide. But um, if you notice, he says, yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin. It's almost as if he's responding to a prior conversation because that sentence structure is kind of unusual. Otherwise, he just would have wrote, I did kill Betty Jo Booker, or I killed Betty Jo Booker, but he says, yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker. So it implies a prior conversation. Um, although it doesn't prove it, but it does imply it. Okay, so that's one thing, but also Kreider declared uh, that he had never had much faith in the notes, but he said he was satisfied that the note Tennyson wrote in which he claimed he was responsible for the three murders was the last one written before his death. Another note in which Tenn Tennyson asked finders to disregard all others was written previously, <coughs> Kreider contended. So Kreider did not believe that the note that's been called the denial note was actually written after the confession note. He believes the confession note was written last, and therefore the denial note, it does not make sense that he could have been referring to something that he wrote later in time. And also it turns out that they were all found at the same time anyway. But, but this is Kreider talking about it. It probably was disconcerting for him to not have his viewpoint uh, represented in other papers because it was definitely not represented um, in the Texarkana Gazette, for example. Okay, so in general, if I were to sum up, summarize my research, I would say that every single issue raised by newspapers and authorities which suggested that H.B. Tennyson was not the phantom killer has been disputed or is, is in doubt. And I'm going to talk more about that. So let's talk about the possibility of a false confession. We know that while alive, people sometimes make false confessions. Um, sometimes they do so to high profile crimes to get attention. However, Unsolicited voluntary confessions made outside the context of interrogation are generally regarded as likely to be true unless evidence suggests otherwise. Um, I was very curious about the idea. Could HB have <laughs> committed suicide and left behind false confessions of murder in a suicide note? So I consulted with Ron, Dr. Ron Maris. He is the world's expert in suicidology. And on April 24, 2014, I asked Ron a couple of questions. I said, number one, do you know of any instances whatsoever where someone has committed suicide while leaving behind a suicide note containing what has been verified or believed to be a false confession of murders? This is what it, his exact quote. He says, quote, I know of no cases of suicide followed by false confession of prior murders. It just does not happen. And I've had thousands of suicide cases at this point in my career. Theoretically, I suppose one could falsely confess to prior violence to get attention, like Munchausen syndrome or the Susan Smith case in South Carolina, which I worked on. But why would one falsely want that kind of attention after death? And I don't think he did. I don't think HB actually did want that attention. And that's why, among other things, I think he put his confession at the bottom of a, a stack of papers in a locked box that he probably expected only his family was going to find. It does not, he did not put it saliently where it could be found easily. So it does not appear that he wanted attention. The other thing I asked Ron Maris 
was how many examples do you know where someone has committed suicide and left behind a suicide note containing true confessions of murder? Quote, as, as he says, as for your second question, there are some suicides who leave behind a true confession of murder, but not a false one. It can be a last ditch effort to clear one's conscience or just set the record straight since the murderer will be long gone when the news breaks. Okay, so statistically speaking, if HB made false confessions of murder in a suicide note, he would be the first person in recorded history, as far as we know, to ever have done so. So it would statistically be very, very it would be unprecedented. Does that mean it, that, that what he said was true? It doesn't prove it, but it would be highly unlikely from a statistical standpoint for him not to have been telling the truth in his confession of murders. Okay, if you understand HB's suicide scene, you will understand how newspaper accounts, including those in the Texarkana Gazette, were misleading. Okay, so based on what the newspapers in, in Fayetteville said, uh, the Northwest uh, Arkansas Times, I believe it is, um, they believe HB committed suicide on Thursday, November 4th, 1948. Um, he he un, unquestionably did it with cyanide that he purchased at a pharmacy locally and lied to them saying he was gonna, that he needed to poison some rats that had infested his house uh, when in fact he intended on taking it himself. So he appears to have died Thursday and then was discovered on Friday. So the other thing that's, that's clear from looking at the papers and comparing them, it's very clear that all the major notes left behind by HB uh, were found on Friday, November 5th, 1948. The note that has been erroneously called the denial note, the note in which they allege he you know, wrote and denied uh, the confessions of murder, um, that was found before the confession note. That was the note that was most saliently presented on his dresser, um, seemingly presented to the public or whoever it was he expected to find him, and he did not make any effort to hide that note. And that was the first note found. So, so that's, that's another misleading thing in the paper. Um, also, his suicide scene, to, to, as far as suicide can be rational, I mean, we don't generally consider suicide rational, but as far as the thought process, he doesn't appear to have been psychotic at the time he took his life. Um, if he was guilty of the murders to which he confessed, if he wanted to make a private confession to his family while leaving behind a suicide note for public consumption that would not stigmatize his family any more than necessary, the way the, scene, the suicide scene was set up makes perfect sense. The use of a riddle in, in, to lead to a confession in a locked strong box was seemingly the least manipulative method that HB could think of to assure that he would successfully commit suicide while at the same time presume that only his family would gain access to the locked strong box and thus the confession of murders. So this, this is kind of a, a schematic representation of his room where he was found. Um, he, was, he was deceased on the bed in his room. He had a dresser and um, there was a folder called, it was a brown folder titled My Final Word. It kind of looked like, was prepared kind of like a term paper and um, it was in that folder on his dresser by the bed that the so-called denial note was found. Okay, that's the note that has the, the, the denial of, of other reasons why he took his life. There was also a BB pen. There was a riddle note seemingly on, either on the dresser or maybe tucked in the folder. And then somewhere in the room there was a locked strong box. It, it's, there's no indication that that was actually on the dresser. It was in the room, but there's no indication of it necessarily being on the dresser. So it, it might have been in a closet. It might have been in a less salient place, but it certainly wasn't seemingly, as far as we know, presented in a way as to say, here, you need to open this up, or this has something important in it. So that's, that's uh, but it, ultimately, the, the, it was the police who busted it open and found the confession note. So the dresser, so that has this, my final word note. Um, once again, this, this is the, the, uh, comp, the wording in the final word note. This is an excerpt. It says, please disregard all of the messages which I have written. They are only thoughts which I was thinking about as possible reasons for taking my own life. As I think about it, it's none of these things. They are not the reason for this incident. There's a much larger point to it all, happiness. Now, in nowhere here is he denying a confession of murder, which, which he's believed to have written afterwards by Bruce Cryer. He's simply denying other reasons that he might have taken his life, other than the one he's giving here, that is to say happiness, whatever that might mean to him. So it's not a denial of a confession of murder, but yet it was presented as if that's what it was. And it was also presented as if it was found after the confession, of which it was not. Okay, so also in the dresser was a riddle note. And some, some people, one friend of mine asked me, why so many riddles? Turns out uh, he actually did not present that many riddles. There were only two riddles he appears to have written, one of which appears to have been abandoned, one of which appears to be instructions that were uh, about the combination to get into the lockbox. And uh, the reason I showed the picture of the Batman's Riddler is because this character had debuted in 1948, and HB was known to, to be an avid reader of comic books. So, who knows, he might have been reading Batman. That's, that's, that, that's neither here nor there, but it's speculative, but it's an interesting thought. Okay, 
So there was only one riddle that was saliently presented. The other one was appear, apparently abandoned. And um, so despite the fact that many people believe multiple riddles were left, it wasn't, it wasn't really that uh, um, cryptic. Um, the riddle note was pretty simple. It said, in a tube, a paper is found. It rolls on color and is dry in sound. There was one paper that used the word round. It's possible that sound is a typographical error. It actually, he had it hidden in the pen. So it actually does make sense. He actually might have intended it rolls in color and is dry and round. And there's some similar wording from an advertisement from, a, from one of the BB pen advertisements that uses similar wording. So I think he might have meant round there. But e either way, the head removes, the tail will turn, and inside is the sheet you yearn. Uh, two Bs, that's the, referring to the BB pen. Two Bs mean a lot when they are together. These clues should lead you to it. So basically, he apparently had a combination of, of the lockbox, scroll, the front sheet of paper inside the pen. Okay, so that was the BB pen. Here, here's, here's a BB pen from, from circa 1948, two Bs being together. So, and it's obviously it's round and, and would roll um, a little bit closer, the two BBs. Okay, so um, I don't know the exact nature of the lockbox he had. I've been curious about, was it a dial? Was it a rotary uh, wheel uh, combination? Some of these are programmable. These can be programmable, I think, but um, I'm guessing it might have been something more like that. But I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, okay, so the lock combination box. So in the box at the bottom of a stack of papers was the confession note. Okay, it does not appear to have been presented anywhere else in the room. It certainly does not appear that he was trying to, you know, let that be the thing that was discovered and thus create publicity for him. He seemingly did not expect authorities to bust open his strong box, but they did. And as a result, uh, they discovered the confession note and, and that's how the publicity occurred. Okay, so here's a little more elaboration of that same note with, with some, some of the additional wording that was in the confession note. As I said before, he said, why did I take my own life? Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Buddy Joe Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night and kill Mr. Starks and try to get Mrs. Starks. He also go, goes on to say, you wouldn't have guessed it. I did it when mother was either out or asleep and no one saw me do it. For the guns, I disassembled them and discarded them in different places. Uh, by the t in 1946, during the Phantom Killings, his mother and father had already divorced. Uh, he was living at home alone with his mother in, in a relatively large house. So it would have been easier for him to come and go if she was asleep as compared to if other siblings had still been living there. So it was just him and his mother. Okay. Um, some insight can come from comparisons between Texarkana Gazette and other papers like the Northwest Arkansas Times of Fayetteville. Um, also, I would say that... Um, this is uh, J.Q. Mahaffey, you see labeled up there, and I make a comment down below that if you live in a town with a recent history of lynching, that's as recently as 1942, and have a child who commits suicide and leaves behind a suicide note implicating himself as a serial killer, it never hurts to be dear friends with the editor of the local newspaper. And that was exactly the circumstances in the case of H.B. Tennyson. His mother was dear friends with J.Q. Mahaffey, uh, who was the editor of the Texarkana Gazette. Her name was Jimmy, his mother, J. H.B.'s mother. Uh, they frequently played gin rummy and poker together, and Mahaffey was one of the pallbearers at HGB's private funeral. And also, a lot of the representation of the Tennyson family to other newspapers were quotes of J.K. Mahaffey. I think it's uh, out in Lubbock and places in Texas, I've seen him quoted um, as talking about the family, as if he was the representative of the family. Maybe, maybe implicitly he was. Okay, so this, this is very important to understand the timeline of, of what was discovered. So, November 1948, H.B. Tennyson's suicide, he was, his body was discovered on November uh, 5th, which was a Friday. Okay, the, what, what, what I call the, he wrote, he titled it my final word. I call it the final word note. It begins with the phrase, please disregard all other messages. Um, this is the note that was presented saliently in the brown folder on his dresser. It was almost certainly the note which would have been found first. Okay, the confession note was not found until the lockbox was busted open. So it makes no sense that they would not have read what was in that folder uh, before busting open the lockbox. Okay, so that but but they did the, the, it did, it does indicate in the papers that the confession note was also found on Friday. So sometime later that evening or later that afternoon, whenever it was, they also did bust open the box. So that appears to also happen on Friday, but after this disregard or final word note was found. Okay, despite the final note word being found first, it was not regarded as a denial, cancellation, or recanting of the confession of murders. Consequently, the confession the following day was publicized. Okay, so even though the final word note was already found on Friday, there was, there was no spin or interpretation of it as being a denial of murder uh, the following day when the, when the big headlines broke. Okay, but then on Monday, two days later, now three days after the, 
the uh, final word note was found, the Texarkana Gazette and some other newspapers began publicizing the unwarranted interpretation of the final word note as a denial or cancellation of the confession note. And I would say it was wholly unwarranted. And of course, and of course Sheriff Pryor would also, as you see, would, would have agreed that that was unwarranted as well. Okay, and, and the Fayetteville paper was more fair. They said, kind of in the spirit of Sheriff Pryor, the series of notes were confusing. That was their headline. Whereas if you look in the Texarkana Gazette, uh, on the same day, the Texarkana Gazette is declaring, note canceling murder admission found, as if it had just been found, okay? No such thing. So I think J.Q. Bahaffey might have had some influence on the choice of headlines, but that's speculation on my part. Okay. Okay, so it appears that when Duty wrote the disregard all of the messages, as I said before, he was likely referring to notes that might be found in his room among his personal effects, but not necessarily to the confession note in his strong box. Regardless, though, there, as I pointed out, there is no denial or recanting of a confession of murders in any of H.P.'s notes, as far as we know. Okay, there's also other things that were published in the Texarkana Gazette that were irrelevant beliefs about H.P. Tennyson that pre were presented as if they made a difference, but they really didn't. Um, his older brother, J.D. Jr., uh, said, quote, I don't see how anybody who knew H.B. could believe he could have committed these murders he refers to in his notes. He just wasn't the type. Now, that's the same kind of textbook generic thing that many family members say once someone has been discovered to be a serial killer. It's, it, no one, usually people say, wow, they just weren't the type. That's common. So that doesn't really give us any insight. Plus, J.D. Uh, JD Jr. was already living up in Memphis at the time. He had already moved away. He wasn't even in Texarkana. He wasn't having interaction with H.B. Uh, frequently, at least, at that time. Maybe during the summers, but not much more than that. Uh, Mrs. Clark Brown, the mother of the Phantom's victim, Betty Jo Booker, called on Miss Jimmy Tennyson Saturday afternoon to offer her sympathy and to assure her that she felt young H.B. Tennyson had nothing to do with the death of her daughter. And that might be the opinion of Miss Brown, but that doesn't, that's not an authoritative opinion. It's not an evidence-based opinion. Um, but when it's printed in the paper, it does, it's good public relations for the Tennyson family, um, but it doesn't really give you an authoritative sense because Miss Betty Jo Booker's mother would not have been in a position to, to really make a, a, a probabilistic statement about whether H.B. was likely to have been telling the truth. Okay. I've also heard some illogical arguments about H.B. Tennyson. Some, one, one I heard, and I, I mentioned this in 2014, was that one person said, since the Phantom's M.O. or modus operandi was to murder people by firearms, and since H.B. Tennyson committed suicide by mercury cyanide poisoning, it's therefore unlikely that H.B. Tennyson was the Phantom because he would have used the same method. And of course, that's not true. There, there are people who are known to kill people with firearms who later committed suicide with carbon monoxide by turning their car on in their garage. So there's, and per, plus, mercury cyanide is a very unpleasant way to go. So it's not like that was like a more pleasant way to go. And H.B. probably knew that, um, but I'm not sure. Um, also, another person said, committing suicide by poisoning is, not, here we go, not as courageous or brave as committing suicide by using a firearm. Well, based on what I know about cyanide poisoning, I don't think that's true. It might be might be less unpleasant to go quickly from a firearm than by mercury cyanide poisoning. Okay, uh, this is kind of a sidebar, but I, I want to mention that this is a skull, and uh, I'm in possession of this skull, this, not with me today, but I know where it is, so we'll put it that way. Um, this was a skull that, that H.B.'s older brother, Craig Tennyson, brought back during World War II, or as World War II was finishing up, perhaps, and at first he said it was the skull of a Japanese soldier, kind of implying that it might have been someone that he was in, had been in battle with, and he gave it to H.B., um, but after the suicide of H.B., Craig changed the story and said that, no, it was actually a skull that he had found in the Philippines during World War II. And uh, after H.B.'s suicide, the skull was also given to my grandfather, Alfred Sr., um, and it was kept up on a high shelf at the Tennyson Brothers factory for a long time. And I've often wondered what this skull might have meant to H.B. This is, this is the older brother, Craig, who brought the skull back. There's a comic book that might have been in the comic stand of the sort that someone like that H.B. might have seen given his extensive reading of comic books. Um, Newspaper accounts said that H.B. Tennyson, after his suicide, was said by his friends to have an inferiority complex. And I'm just wondering if, certainly, if you look at H.B.'s academic performance compared to all of the success that Craig had, both as a, as a war hero and afterwards, um, H.B. could have felt less, and that skull could have tapped into some feeling of, like, oh, yeah, my brother's a hero because this is a symbol of his, her his heroism, this skull, which in some ways represents death. So whether that tied into the psychology of H.B., I don't know. Um, I don't know what it meant to H.B., but it's certainly a thought. But I don't consider that the strong evidence. I'm not, that's not the persuasive, that's not what makes him more compelling uh, uh, suspect than swimming. So H.B. Tennyson's neighbor, this is starting to get into more compelling evidence. So I want to try to show the context of his neighbor. This is the house he grew up in. This house is still present today. 
The current owner added some antebellum columns onto it, which were never around in HB's day, but the house is essentially still intact. It's uh, originally was 600 Hickory Street. It's now, it's been, the, the address has been changed to 602 Hickory Street. It's the same house though. Uh, this is a modern Google view uh, of, of Hickory Street. And if you look, this is Hickory Street right here. That's the Arkansas Vada going that way. This is HB's Tennyson's house right there. Okay, so if you label it, uh, there you can see his house. And I have a lot of other, several other in, uh, entities labeled, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but uh, understanding his neighborhood and what was proximal to him and his house, I think is important. And, and at the very least provides some interesting circumstantial evidence. Okay, here's another picture. This is a photograph from the 1960s. Um, some of the structures that had been torn down and that by the time that Google photo was taken were not torn down yet in this photo. So just to forward you, now, we're now looking kind of from, from the east, looking westward. This is, the, this is the old Tennyson Brothers building that got torn down. There's the Arkansas Viaduct. If you keep on going that way, that's Broad Street right there. Um, HB's house is right here. And I'm gonna, I have a label for these as well. So there you go. Okay, so I have Hickory Street labeled. Okay, so Hickory Street, of course, feeds into 71 South towards Shreveport. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about several entities in this photograph. Um, this, this is a kind of an old one, the Sanborn maps. There's HB's house, um, and then I have several uh, examples labeled here. So I'm going to start with number one, um, but before I do, I want to just briefly allude to the movie Silence of the Lambs. One, one breakthrough in terms of the uh, FBI detectives was um, the, uh, the idea of coveting, that we covet what we see every day. That is to say, people tend to covet that which they're familiar with or by virtue of historical proximity. Another variant or another related uh, adage is out of sight, out of mind, insight, in mind. Okay, so the, the one I had labeled number one up there, that, that was actually the house where Cora Tennyson, who was a first cousin of H.B. grew up. Um, Cora was very much uh, into pageantry and, uh, and went to the Patty Hill School, as, as did uh, at least H.B.'s sister before their financial problems, before, before the father left the family. Um, but Cora did not. She did not have that financial disruption in her, in her life. So she was able to continue that. And this is a, an outing that they took with uh, HB's father, uh, Jim Daniel Sr. HB's holding a 22 rifle here. This is his sister, Alice Joe. This is Cora. Uh, there's Cora. Cora went on to be a model. Um, in, she was a professional model for a sh short time in New York before moving back to Texas. There's a picture of one of her modeling shots. But she was very, very much into glamour and, and, and me, all the things that HB was not and perhaps some things which he coveted or wanted could have been represented in someone like Cora. This is an interesting picture given to me by one of the children of HB's sister, Alice Jo, who was in the middle there. And interestingly, this picture is torn right through Cora's body. I never knew why. I mean, maybe it was just carelessness, but it's, it's, been a, it's a combination of cutting and tearing through her body as opposed to like between the, the images of the people standing in the photo. And it just struck me that that's kind of an odd thing. I don't know if that represents the psychology of how someone might have felt about Cora or not, but that's the condition that I received that photo. Also of note, um, HB, if you look at, uh, I'll show you a close up in a minute. At the, at the bottom of the picture is an empty box of 22 cartridges, 22 rifle cartridges at, at his feet. And um, come to that in a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll come to back to the 22 rifle cartridges in a moment. But let me talk a little more about the neighborhood. Um, Betty Jo Booker. So, okay. So this is, I mentioned Betty Jo Booker not because this is the armory behind Duty's house. This is not where Betty Jo was playing the night that she was murdered. But I have been told by at least two members of HB's class that, that uh, high school bands did play there. I was told by Dave Daly um, that on occasion the Rhythm Airs with Jerry Atkins, uh, which Betty Jo played for, had actually played there at the armory. So there certainly was the idea that this was a place where a lot of kids and high school kids were having fun at, at dances and, and, and live music events. And uh, it, in some ways, it was kind of right outside his window. He, he could see it, but he was socially awkward, and he, he might have been avoiding and not even have fit in had he gone to that. But yet, it was still there in a, almost in a, as a visual tease for what he did not have in many ways. This is, this is from the house. This is actually in the room that's believed to be his room at the, at the six, what is now 602 Hickory Street. Okay, so, so this is another example. Katie Stark's, I, um, Katie Stark's sister, Lois Russell, and her husband, Ed, lived in the neighborhood um, at three. By the way, the armory was at two. So when I mentioned Betty Jo Booker, I've kind of covered one and two. Now moving down here, this is where Lois Russell, Ed Russell lived. Um, and they were very close to Katie and Virgil Starks. And Katie and Virgil Starks were there. Uh, Benny Wood, who I'm going to show you an interview of in a moment, estimates that they were there at least once a week on weekends and maybe even during the week when they were at school, but that they came by there frequently. And uh, 
HB's friend, one of the persons who became the pallbearer at his, at his funeral, James Freeman, lived right here. And HB was also close friends with Don Wood, who lived under the same roof with Lois and Ed, but the house was divided. It was a duplex, uh, but there was a common door between the two halves, and according to Benny Wood, I asked him specifically, he said the door is frequently ajar, usually never locked. Sometimes they, they would shut it for privacy, but, but there was cross traffic between the two halves of the house. Okay, so I want to show this interview Benny Wood. This has never been shown before. This is Mr. Benny Wood, and let me know if the volume is too loud. This is John Tennyson. It is October the 23rd, 2016, on a Sunday afternoon at 2.39 p.m. I have the honor of being with Mr. Benny Wood in his home outside of Mineral Wells, and Mr. Wood has agreed to let me interview him and to share his recollections about a great many things. And uh, sir, I want to thank you, first of all, for your time today. Uh, I want to start by letting you introduce yourself and say some about your background. Thank you, John. John, my name is Benny Brack Wood. My middle name, Brack, is, it just so happens, was my mother's maiden name. She was a Brack before her and dad married, and so I got daddy's first name and mother's last name for my middle name and then the Wood name. And we got within about a block of the house, that 414 Hickory. And there were blinking lights all over that block and around that house. We could not imagine what in the world was going on. And as soon as Mr. Henshaw stopped, Daddy threw the door of the car open and jumped out and run for the porch. And Lois was standing on the front porch. And she saw Daddy, and the first thing that came out of her mouth, and I remember it as if it was today, she said, by God, Benny, he killed Virgil and shot Kate. And Dad ran up on the porch and then grabbed Lois, and they went in the house. And, of course, Mother got us boys out, and we went into our apartment. And what happened at that point, I don't know. But starting the next day, things began to really break open and we began to find out what was going on. So based on what you've told me, that would have been May 3rd of 1946. I remember the authorities got some relatives and friends of Kate and Virgil and Lois and Ed's and armed them with weapons. My daddy was one of them. He had to go to the police station and they armed him with a 38 revolver and told him that he would stand guard in the hospital room with Kate and that they would take turns working shifts and Dad told us about it and said we were told that we would not let anybody in that room that wasn't supposed to be in that room. They were concerned that someone who had attempted to kill Kate might come back. They knew she saw him. Hmm. That's been the mystery one of the great mysteries of the Phantom Killer in Texarkana was when it happened, and I have been in Kate and Virgil's home many times out east of Texarkana on the cotton farm. Been in every room in that house, all around that house, time and again. So you, you, had, got, you had known them well even prior to the attack yes, on the Starks? Yes, absolutely so. Now, the reason that we get to know them so well was because Ed and Lois were kin to Virgil and Kate. Now, how's, how, here's how they were kin, if I remember it correctly. Two sisters, Lois and Kate, were sisters. I've, yeah, I've heard that as well. Ed married one sister. 
Virgil married the other sister. And that's how they got to be so close. They were family. So, and did you first meet Virgil and Kate Starks as a result of them visiting Lois? With Lois and Ed. Okay. Yes. How often, if you had to guess from just a minute or just uh, estimating, how, how often do you think uh, Lois, uh, not Lois, or how often do you think Virgil and Kate visited Lois and her husband? Oh, my goodness. It seems to me, as a young boy back then, that uh, this was almost weekly. Okay. So there because was... time and time again, we would all, the, Kate and Virgil would come over and Dad would be off work and we'd all be there and lo and behold, the men would get together and next thing you know, somebody's done got the idea that we're fixing to have a fish fry and we'd all load up and head for Spring Lake Park. So Virgil, Virgil and Katie would join you for fish fries? Oh, yes. I see. Oh, yes. I see. Yes, in and out of the house often. So both often, and, and you and Don were also present at those events. Yes, as well, time and again. Then we were in school, of course, and there were times that they would come by. We wouldn't know it. She was cleaning her jewelry, and she said she heard a crash, and she knew Virgil was in the little day room or the little den, listening to the radio and reading the evening paper, and she thought the radio had somehow fallen off the table and she got off the bed, stepped to the door and turned to where Virgil was sitting. His chair was there with the back to the windows, windows all around the little day room. And he was standing up in front of his chair, holding the back of his head. He said, Kate, I've been shot and then fell back into his chair. And she turned, and there's over across on the wall is one of the old style crank phones that you have to ring the operator. She stepped over there real quick, grabbed the earpiece, and was cranking the phone and turned and looked back at Virgil and saw the man standing in the window pointing a rifle at her. And before she could move, he fired and shot her in the face just below her bottom lip. And the bullet tranched it and came out behind her left ear. I've seen her. I've talked to her. I've seen both scars. It's a ter terrible thing to have happen. Did the worst, so far as horror is concerned, that I've never been able to get over. When he shot her, she saw him in the window. She dropped the phone, went through the kitchen door, out onto the back porch, and he was coming in on the back porch, and she saw him again. When you said she saw someone pointing a rifle at her, did, did she specifically identify the weapon as being a rifle as opposed to a handgun? The information that I heard discussed was rifle. Okay. And you, you heard her talking about this with someone? or No, just members of the family that she had talked with and dead. Uh, Kate and Virgil liked being around daddy. They loved Daddy. And Kate would talk to Dad. So there was, there was no doubt based on those discussions that they considered it to have been a rifle and that Katie considered it to have been a rifle? The, you, you have to see the scar under her lip and behind her ear to understand that it's a twenty-two. Okay. Now... Were there 22 pistols? Yes. But the information that was discussed in all of the discussions about the shooting was rifle. Okay. After she was released from the hospital, they already had made plans and had it set up at the house where we lived. We lived in one side of the house. Ed and Lois lived in the other side. At that time, you were living on the first floor. Right. Okay. Right. Second floor fire was 
long gone. You, you know, was the second floor ever? Uh, no. It was so that no it one was ever closed lived. off. Okay. No. Okay. It was closed off. Okay. They had already made arrangements. The room that Katie was going to stay in, the bed she was going to sleep in, and the people, the men that would be there in that house with weapons to guard her all the time she was there. And they moved her secretly from the hospital to the house on Hickory Street. And who all knew that she was going to be living there in that house? Have no idea. Okay. But we was... certainly didn't know. Hmm. Okay. Your father did not tell you? No. Okay, so you did not realize. No, there was things that... There were things that were never discussed. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can re can relate is what I heard discussed. It was summertime, and what the authorities said that we had to do in that house, we Daddy had to get hammer and nails and nail all the windows shut so they couldn't be opened. And at night, before we went to bed, he had to nail all the front door and the back door shut with nails so they couldn't be opened. And all we had was an oscillating fan. We didn't have air conditioning. Wow, so that made the heat much worse. This is summertime. Yeah. It was miserable. This went on for a few nights, but you'd have to know my daddy. Daddy said, let him come. Said, we're raising the windows and opening the doors. And he got up and got the hammer and pulled every nail, opened every window, and opened the doors so we could get some air in that house. If we move forward in time from the summer of 1946 to the fall of 1948, I know that, and we've talked about this before, but um, my first cousin once removed, H.B. Tennyson, um, took his life and left a suicide note claiming responsibility for some of the murders, including the, the killing of Virgil Starks and the attack on Katie. And I know in the past you had told me how, how your brother Don came to hear about that and how that affected him. Yes. What had happened, John, H.B. Tennyson and his sweet mother and sister and I don't know how many in the family, but those I nowhere in the family, just lived one block from us. H.B. and my brother Don got to be very, very close friends. And Don would go up to H.B.'s and uh, I'd go along with him. And time and again after school in the evenings and on Saturdays and during the summer, we were always together playing with H.B. H.B. would play football and softball and just whatever, just boys hanging around. Never wandered around anywhere. We're not, uh, those boys were older than I was. They never encouraged any kind of misconduct or to get in trouble or wander off somewhere like boys do. Never happened. When we went to visit H.B., we never left that yard. We stayed in the yard. He came to our house. We stayed in the yard. Did, did you ever go inside H.B.'s house? Or, yes. And did, did he ever go inside your house? Yes. I see. Yes. Okay, so both the yard and the house. Yes. We lived a uh, uh, house next door to us on the corner. Uh, the Freeman family lived there. And uh, they had a, a son that was about the same age of Don and H.B., and at times he would pal around with us, but not very often. And that's, he was, that's James Freeman. Yeah, that was James. And uh, James was uh, kind of introverted. He was a little quiet, reserved, but uh, he played, uh, played in the band with Don and played trombone and was uh, pretty talented when it came to playing the trombone. And... Uh, uh, but he just never palled around with Don and H.B. and myself when we were together that much. So Mostly the, when we were just at our house. So, so when you would see James Freeman, he would come to your house? 
or oh yeah, he'd come out of his house because they were right next to each other. Directly adjacent. Our house and the Freeman's house was twenty five steps apart. Yeah, and, and I know you mentioned at one point, and I I wanted maybe to let you elaborate, but you mentioned that at some point you it became apparent to you that James Freeman was making comments about girls or women or something that was that felt inappropriate to you or uncomfortable. Yeah, yes, it did. I, I heard him on occasions, and that's why I, I started staying away from him was because of some remarks he would make about women and girls that I certainly didn't approve of. And if mom or dad had heard it, uh, they'd have stopped us from associating with him real quick. And uh, uh, Don was old enough to handle it and understand what was going on. And so he made it a point to spend more time with HB. I see. And just not necessarily to be too graphic, but in terms of understanding the kinds of things that James Freeman was, would say were these sexually inappropriate comments about women, or it, how would you classify the, the content? That's about as good a classification as uh, one would want. Mm -hmm. did, did he say anything that suggested violence or, or non-consent? No. Nothing of that sort? No. Okay, but Never. just. Never. But just just speaking of women more as as uh, sexual objects, yes, more so, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I know that you had told me the story before of how your brother Don reacted to hearing the confession note left behind by H. B. Tennyson. Yes. And it, it, I was I, I wanted just to review for the people who might be watching the video the the essence the shocking essence of the note. And maybe yes. let you say what how Don yes. reacted. But yes. So as you as you know on November fifth. Uh, 1948, it was a Friday, I believe, up in Fayetteville, um, HB was found apparently having committed suicide. Yes. And there was a lockbox, and when the police busted open the lockbox, at the bottom of that lockbox was a paper in which there was a confession of murders. Basically, what HB said uh, was that he had killed Virgil Starks and attempted to get Katie, and he also explicitly confessed to having killed Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin. And as to whether he was actually intending to confess any of the other murders, it's not clear, but he did make a comment to the effect, why did I take my own life? You would too if you had committed two double murders. So some people interpreted that as him having at least tried to imply or convey the idea that he was actually responsible to all, for all five people who got killed. But it's, there are different interpretations that are made from that note. But he, he definitely explicitly confessed to having killed Virgil Starks and Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin. Yes. And I know from what you told me that came as quite a shock to Don when it, when it became broadcast, but I wonder if you might recall your, what you recall from that. Yes, I remember it uh, vividly. Uh, we were living on uh, College Hill at the time, and I c can remember Don... And it was late in the evening. Don was in the bathroom and he was shaving. I remember him, him shaving. And the radio was on. We didn't have a television. We never had a television until we moved out to Wake Village. Don was listening to the radio and all of a sudden there came on the radio, we interrupt this program as they normally do bring this following announcement and they made the announcement about H.B. Tennyson. H.B. Tennyson was one of mine and Don's dear friends. That's who they thought the Phantom Killer was, was H.B. Tennyson. I remember how Don stopped shaving and he called into Mother, who was in the kitchen, and said, Mama, did you hear that? And Mother was standing there and said, Yes, I did. And I was sitting there stone dead still. I wasn't, I wasn't moving. Because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because I had lived through the Kate and Virgil situation very closely in the same house. And now here's one of our dear friends who they are saying is the one that's guilty of these atrocities. And, and H.B. had at times been in that house as well. 
Is, from what is that correct? In in our house there at Ed and Lois's, okay. yes. Okay, at yes. least in your part of the house. Yes, our part of the house. Mm -hmm. Don finished shaving and, and told us and mother said, I'm, I'm going to the police station right now. Mama said, okay. And I never saw Don act this way. Uh, he was almost in shock, if I understand what shock is. And this really got to him because he and HB were close. I know that from what I've read in the newspapers that Don served as a pallbearer at, yes. at the private funeral. Yes, yes. And so he hurriedly got dressed and left and went up to the police station. What he discussed, he never would discuss with mother, or daddy, or me. If he did discuss it with anybody, it would have been dead, but it would have been in private. Did Don ever give any indication as to whether he thought H.B. might have been telling the truth or not? He didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. And no one this far or so far in my life has ever convinced me beyond a shadow of a doubt that H.B. Tennyson was the one that did those things. I'm still not convinced. And I know my brother went to his grave, not convinced. And for I never saw anything in all the years that we knew H.B. and the times that we were with him. He never said nor did anything that would suggest that type of nature in him in any way. Now, never. I, I suppose this was just playful, but you had mentioned that H.B. had a dog that was deaf that he sometimes would, would jump up behind and scare the dog. But I, I'm gathering from your description it was not a sadistic act. No, okay. no. It was pure fun. We would play with that puppy. It was a puppy, a bird dog puppy. And I guess he was about, oh, maybe two months old, that pup, maybe three. But the poor little thing was deaf, and uh, H.B. Would, uh, would get a little stick sometime and he would slip up behind the dog and uh, just touch him. This, this puppy okay. that H.B. had was a full-blooded bird dog. Okay. No question about, about its, uh, what type of dog it was. But uh, he would slip up behind it and poke it with a stick and it would jump and turn around him. Then uh, it, it was fun because we'd chase it and it would chase us. And so it was not, you did not take that as him being cruel to animals? He was not, oh no. Okay. You better not bother that puppy because you'd have to deal with H.B. then. Mm, okay. No. But he, in terms uh, of what H.B. would do, he, no, H.B. did no, not come across. No, okay. no. Never, never did I see him in any way molest that pup. So that's why it no. was so incongruous with what, with who you knew H.B. to be. Yes. It, when, when he made these confessions yes. of murder. Yes, yes. I don't even know that that was his handwriting. I've never ever read whether or not they were able to interpret it as his handwriting. I, I, I don't know. I think that's a valid question. You know, what, yeah, could, could a suicide scene have been staged with, with handwriting or notes that were not his own? That's, that's certainly a question worth asking. I don't have any idea. Now, I know that uh, the only two high school students that I'm aware of who served as pallbearers were your brother Don and also James Freeman. He yes. was a pallbearer. And James Freeman was the class of 1949, so one year below one Don. One year below. Yeah. And, but then James Freeman, for whatever reason, I want to say it was 1974, but it was in the early 70s, he himself committed suicide. And according to, I talked to his relatives and uh they don't have complete details, but one thing they did say is that he committed suicide with a, a gun that the, or a pistol that the family did not know until that time that he even owned, or that he even owned a gun. And um, there are some reports. I've, I've talked to one woman directly in his family, as well as someone with whom she has, says she has spoken to, both who, who say that, that he sexually molested them. And now the, the, the details I don't have, but, but just that there was inappropriate touching to the extent that they never wanted to be around him again. So it, at least it seems consistent with the way he might have objectified or talked about women, but 
Obviously, it sounds like you were not witness to him actually assaulting anyone. No, Nothing no, like that. no. I uh, I can remember uh, how mild mannered HB was. Very mild mannered, easy going. Uh, There's still questions today about who did it. They're still looking for the phantom killer. It's still an open case. It's still an open case. I understand. How how can I sit here and say HB did it when it's still an open case? I'm not going to do it. I agree with that sentiment. I'm just not going to do it. I agree with that sentiment. Uh, We... We lived through that. We made it through it. Is there anything that we have talked about today that you would feel uncomfortable being shared publicly, or, or do you feel comfortable? I'm being... comfortable with whatever I say. Okay, very good. If I don't mean it, I won't say it. Okay, Biddy Wood. <laughs> okay, so that's the longest interview I'm going to be showing today, and uh, I know I want to be, we have a, we've gone about an hour to it, so I'm going to continue onward. Um, <clears throat> moving back to the neighborhood, James Freeman, with which uh, we were making reference in that video, um, James Freeman was in the band. This, this is actually Dave Daly, class of 48 2, still alive, legendary <coughs> Texture Canada drummer. There's HB there in the back. But also in the same marching band was this person who was James Freeman. He would, this is James, uh, his cousin, or actually his nephew, said this was his senior, a senior photo of James pl- playing the um, trombone. This was a picture uh, characterized by a local collector as being from 1945, the Arkansas High School Band. I don't know for sure the identity of, of whether that's actually HB or that's James or whether any of these women here in the, the two particular uh, with the brunettes uh, and the third and fourth might have been Betty Jo. But at the, very least, at the very least, this picture demonstrates that the saxophone players did sit approximately to the trombone players. Um, but I can't, I can't vouch for the specific identity of these. Um, I also learned from other people, one being Rule Beasley, that when you join marching band in seventh grade, you started going to the classes with the high school students. So even though HB was a year below Betty Jo Booker, he would have been at band rehearsal in classes with her um, uh, whenever, even when he was in junior high school before she moved to the Texas side. So um, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to the interview of Rule Beasley later. But next up, this, this is perhaps one of the most interesting interviews I want to show you today. Um, this is an interview from a woman who was growing up in 1946. She was living at 308 Hickory Street, on the same side of Hickory Street as HB and James and Benny and his brother Don and Lois and, and uh, Ed Russell, the, the relatives of Katie and Virgil. Uh, Bonnie Plunkett was uh, five years old in 1946, and uh, she, her family is that she's her married name is actually was Woodruff. She married Dale Woodruff. She later became Bonnie Plunkett Woodruff Wilson, so her current husband is last name Wilson. Uh, she's still alive and well, living in Texarkana. Their family are friends with Conlon Nankara. I had actually gone to her house to interview her about and talk to her about Conlon Nankara. And then out of the blue, she recalled something that had happened to her in 1946. And it was amazing because I did not go there to, for this purpose. And she lives out of the way. She lives out, you know, out you know, west of uh, Nash. So it was like, it was just amazing that this even came up. But I want to play for you this interview because she explained something that happened to her when she was five years old in 1946. Uh, she lived here, um, I'm gonna, if we take this map and we kind of push it northward, her house was right here. So this is 308 Bonnie Plunkett. Um, the house is no longer there, but there was a gas station here and her house was right here. Okay, Bonnie Plunkett's house, it was right there. It's, it's now part of the parking lot of that, of that uh, um, business that's there now. Okay, uh, she just recently turned 75. She's a little older than five years old in this picture, but this is her when she was younger, but here she is today. Hi, I'm Bonnie Woodruff Wilson now. Tell, tell me what you remember. Uh, it was, I was around five years old, and it was dark, and I remember going to the window, and the shade was <laughs> up some. And as I looked out the window, there was this person looking back at me with a sh- white thing over his face with two holes in it. And I was a young child, so I wasn't, that afraid. I didn't know what it was. So I do remember that. And over the years I've thought, what could that have been? But now 
I think it could have been, you know, the Phantom, the Killer. Phantom Killer. And and Bonnie, let me just clarify because I want to make sure I've understood you correctly. This you were in your house, which was on Hickory Street. On Hickory Street. And this was the it was the east side of Hickory Street. It was the east side. Okay, and it was near the base of the Arkansas Viaduct. Right. Were you by any chance on the corner? No, there was a service station on the corner, and this big house is when I lived in. It was a duplex, a big yellow house. It was a second building right there. That, that was a service station and this big house. So, so you live in the house next to the service station. Yes. And okay, and the, and there was the service station was on the corner, and the house was the first structure right. uh, adjacent to the service station. Yes. And you were in a first story bedroom, or what kind of? Yes, room? it was just a. It wasn't a two story. Okay. But it was a duplex. It had been divided. On the other side, a, another a young lady and her two children lived on the other side. Her husband was in the Army also. And to the best of your recollection, this was in 1946? 1946. And do you recall, like, if it might have been in the first half of the year or the second half of the year, or what part of the year it might have been in? I don't remember it. Five, all I can remember is just seeing that okay. person outside that window. And, and tell me again, to the, just repeat what you said. Tell me to the best of your recollection what you remember seeing. Just a white... Matt, white sheet or something over a man's with two eye holes looking at me. Okay, so it looks like a sheet over someone's head with two eye two holes. Eye holes. Did you notice that there were any other holes, like for the mouth or nose or anything? I didn't. I, I didn't remember that. I thought, what was that? You know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't even afraid because I don't remember. You, there's remember no question that. that it was a person. It was a person. Okay, it was definitely a person. Could you see the eyes? Or? I could see somebody looking at me through the. Oh. Yeah. You could tell that it was a this person. person. Under, yeah, under the sheet. there was a person there looking at me. And did it look like they had put a sheet over their head, or did it look like it was like a like a pillowcase, like a smaller? Um, yeah, a smaller of, thing. Yeah, there. something smaller. Did you could you see, could you tell where it ended? I mean, did it seem to end at the neck, or did it seem to be like a complete sheet? No, it was just the end of the neck right the neck. there. So it was just interesting. Interesting, and yeah. this this is emotionally poignant for me. So forgive me if I if I'm stumbling for words. That, um, there was another incident you mentioned about some child trying, if, if I use the wrong word, correct me, but trying to touch you inappropriately under the house or something like that? I was, it was around the same time, you know, same month or something, but it was, it was getting dark and I was outside and someone pulled me under the house and started pulling my pants down. But my mother called me about that time and so they let me go and that was the only two times in my life when I was younger like that, that mm -hmm. something. Were you also five years old as well at that time? Yeah. And that was also in 1946? Right. Was that, did they pull you under your house or a different house? The other side. Yeah, the, so it's going It was the north, south side. The south side. I lived on the east side. Okay, the south, that's, okay, I'm, I'm trying to get my direction set. So it was, it was toward the higher number I think of blocks. So, I think some more people lived in the back side of that house. Mm. Well, I'm wanting to say it was long. I think there was some apartments up here and some in the back. Interesting. Okay, and I, I'm going to have to kind of figure out what was built there. So, so I know that so the south side of the house, meaning the side adjacent to the gas station? Yes. Okay, so that house, it was open such that someone could be pulled underneath That's, the center blocks? Those or, old houses were built up off the ground. You okay. Know, you could get under them. Okay. And the, but the per, you don't know. Do you know if it was like someone you recognized, who, or did you know who it was who tried to pull you under the no, house? No. You you just saw their arms. That arms. somebody just pulled me. I walked by and somebody pulled on me. Pulled me. Wow, wow. So yeah. so you didn't identify them, but they pulled on you, and before you could see who it was, your mother's voice they called, called and they let me, you and go. They let me go. And were you scared at that moment? I don't even remember being scared. You know, I was probably scared at the time somebody pulled me, but then they let me go. So I guess I was just a kid. So I was just. I was free. <laughs> Do you know how uh, nothing happened? That they, so, but they did they pull your pants down, or they tried to? They or? tried to. They, tried they to. didn't get them all the way down. Okay, but clearly an inappropriate behavior inappropriate, in addition yeah. to grabbing. Yeah. Did how close to the event where you saw the person with the the sheet over their or over their face? How close to that event was the event when the person grabbed you? I don't know. Okay, but but it seemed to be in nineteen forty six. Well, see, we only lived there. My daddy was in the army only a year and a half. Okay. So it was 
you know. You lived there during that time when he was yeah. in the army? Uh -huh. Okay. Do, do you think you might have first moved into that house in 1945 or whereabouts, what time, what year do you imagine? Probably in 45. Okay. But, but that's something we might go to reconstruct in terms of the occupancy, but it, it was about a year mm -hmm. and a half when world, before World War II had right. ended? Mm -hmm. Okay. And was your, was your father all overseas or? Was he living he, at the yeah, house? he was in Germany. Okay, he was in Germany at the time, mm -hmm. and you were living there in the house, which was a duplex. But somebody said, "Well, how'd your mother make a living?" I said, "Well, he sent her a check each month. She didn't work. Mm -hmm. She had three children who lived there." So you lived there with two siblings mm -hmm. and your mom, mm -hmm. and, and just just so I can place it, what were your siblings' names? Jean and Jerry. Okay, and Jean was a boy or girl. A boy. He was okay. two years older. Okay, so he was he was seven years old, mm -hmm. and Jerry was how old? He's two years younger, okay, so, so he was about three. About three, so so three years old for Jerry. You were five. Jean was seven. And and what is your mother's name? Ella May. Ella May. What was her last name? Plunkett. Plunkett. Okay, and that was her married name. Right. And what was her maiden name? Bradshaw. Bradshaw. Okay. From what I understood, you say you saw someone in 1946 when you were living at that house in the 400 block, the even number mm -hmm. block of of Hickory that had what appeared to be a white sheet mm -hmm. over their head. Right, with an eye hole while he was looking at me. But there, were, there was a separate hole for each eye. Uh -huh. it, yeah, separate hole, and he was looking at me. I, ju I just went to the window, you know, like a little kid looking out, and I saw him looking at me. But And, and uh, it, do, do you remember for sure if, the, if it seemed like to be a, a distinct mask with, the, with an end point where it stopped? I mean, do, do, you, do you have a sense that... I don't remember seeing no big long sheet. It okay, was just it a white there, you know. Okay. But they, I don't know how, how. But it seemed to stop at the shoulders. Seemed to stop there, and then okay. big eye holes. And, and did, did he make? Did he say anything? Did he? Was he moving or or, or just kind of being still? He being still, just looking. And what did? What made him go away? Did he? Did he go away on his own, or did he? Did we you... may have pulled a shade down or something. I don't know. I don't remember what we did. And was anyone else there other than just you? Well, my mother and them, but they didn't see any of that. I just told them, you mm. know. Okay. And so she probably pulled the shade then. You might have gotten there. They might have she, come back and yeah. shut the shade. Did, did, your, did either G Jerry or Jean see the, the person? No. Okay. Well, I want to I want to share with you why I was so intrigued by that recollection. Um, unless you have any other uh, thoughts, I'll, I'll stop no, the table. No, I just had thought about that. I've been thinking about that over the years. Thank you for sharing that. One thing that's, there was an impression that, that I thought was at the 400 block of Hickory during the interview. I later learned it was 308. So 308 is the correct address that they were living at. Um, okay. Um, so basically that's the only other eyewitness example I know of from 1946 where someone had actually seen a white hooded figure of the sort that's reminiscent of what Mary Jean Leary uh, seemed to have described after their attack. Um, this, this was an unknown eyewitness account until 2014. And, and as far as I know, uh, in which time I was interviewing uh, Bonnie.